Hello, I am Jose Ponce, a community journalist at the YouTube channel. Today's presentation will surround the subject matter of youth incarceration. We will discuss the problems of the issue as well as the solution. Please welcome our guests Tanisha Ingram, Charles Nunez, and Stephanie Carbo. Now we will show a portion of video produced by the Correction Association and the YouTube channel detailing the issues of solitary confinement. The Correctional Association teamed up with the Brooklyn Museum and hosted a panel discussion focusing on incarceration. New York is one of the only two states in America to try minors as adults in serious crimes. This practice can lead to many side effects to the young mind and their reacclimation into society. So before we get started, um, from your perspectives, what is the it that we're referring to and what's it got to do with it? What might that it be? Well, first of all, thank you all for being here and thank you, Tanisha. I think the it is the criminal justice system in America. And to take a little bit of a deeper dive into that, I would say there's sort of three it's we're really looking at. And one is how our current policies and practices both increase crime so they don't help public safety and in in addition to that, they really dehumanize and terrorize you know, large sections of our population. So that's the first it, is how our current policies and practices fail both people and communities. The second it is how we police people and prosecute crime. Who gets policed, who gets prosecuted, what are the impacts and who are they borne by? And the third it is mass incarceration as a response to crime. So what is the phenomena of mass incarceration in this country? How does it play out for children and for our elders? Thank you. With these young people that we're speaking about, they do need something to help them realize that they made a mistake and how to correct it and move forward from it and not stay stuck on them and keep committing the same things over and over or just getting worse. Because placing them inside jail, prison, what is it really doing? Right? You're putting a young person in a hostile environment and what do you expect? to come out of that experience for this young person. It's that much harder on that young person to come out of that experience and really make a, 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 a drastic change. So, of course, they need some type of recreation, mentoring, um, some type of therapeutic services to, to, to really tap into them in the cell so they can figure out who they really are and what they really want to be. In New York State, if you're 16, you can't get a tattoo, you can't vote, you can't go to a fake tanning booth, you can't um, go to an R-rated movie. Uh, someone even recently pointed out to me that they were in a hotel where there was a sign that said you can't swim without a parent being present in a hotel pool. But you can be held on Rikers Island and you can be questioned by the police and interrogated without your parent being notified. In our communities, unfortunately, you know, a lot of us are raised by our mothers without our fathers there. So when we, when we don't have that sense of, you know, leadership and, and guidance from a man, not a, not a, a male, a man, it, it, it leaves you like, and then they throw you in a situation where you become, you, 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 you're, it's, you could be victimized because the, the older guy's proud, they're proud of the younger guys. You can go to your cell and, there, and there's a joint under your pillow go, oh man, somebody left me a joint. And if you smoke that joint, you come back and there's a bag of laundry there. And then the dude goes, oh, you got that joint? You go, yeah, good looking out. Thinking somebody looked out for you. And now nah, he goes, nah, you gotta wash that laundry. Mm -hmm. So now you're like, what are you talking about? Yeah, you gotta take care of that laundry. Cause they know your child. They know you don't really know no better. So then you go, oh, and now you gotta, one, you gotta do one or two things because you gotta, you're in prison. You gotta either do that laundry, and then next thing you know, there's a pile of laundry like this in front of your cell, or you gotta go say, oh, I gotta, I gotta defend myself. I gotta make a statement and let people know I'm not gonna be a victim. And all of this, you, you put in this harsh condition, which is like he said, is a mental, is mental torture in a way, so to speak, for a child, because of a mistake you made as a 16 year old. Young people don't need to be in anybody's jail detention center, period. What they need, they really do need some type of services 
some place where they really can be re rehabilitated, you know, a place where it's more therapeutic and not and not more oppressing. Got to take into consideration what solitary confinement is really designed for, right? It's punishment on top of punishment, and I say that meaning jail is punishment. So going to the box is additional punishment. So you're being punished on top of being punished. And another nickname for solitary confinement, believe it or not, is jail. Is that ironic? So, um, I mean, when I when I revisit it and I speak about my experience being in solitary confinement, um, I mean that's the only time, like I guess you would say, the the the, the trauma comes back from that experience because I have to speak about it and, and things like that. But it really doesn't bother me or affect me to that point because I feel people need to need to hear and understand what it's really like being in a six by eight cell, twenty three hours out of the day, every day, you know. <clears throat> but what I try to do is just have people understand and the young people that I work with understand that you don't want to go through that. You don't want to have to live, you don't want to have to live that type of life. You don't, you, you, you don't need that experience under your belt. You become so in tune with yourself, you really don't even care about other people at some point. You start to be like, nobody care about me, so why should I care about anybody else? And it's a sickness, it's like a sickness that it's kind of like you can't even really help it. So what I did, I was like, there's this one thing that you could do that you don't, that you don't really have to have no qualifications for, and that's rapping. <laughs> you know, you don't, have, you don't need to have a GED. Actually, the more your gangster tales you could tell, the better off you could do. And once I seen that, I was like, I'm gonna sneak my way into this music business, but instead of me talking about the hardships of my life, and glorifying it, I'm going to do what my man's doing with his kids and say, I'm going to tell them why they shouldn't pick up a gun. I'm going to tell them the hard sides, the, the harsh realities of joining the game. It's funny because when you look at the artists that's out there, the, the little Waynes and the, you know, the, the, the guys who talk about shoot them up, Sue Wu Gang, Bloods, Crips, that's, they show a little fancy dance, they show the little a rag hanging out the pocket, but they don't show the mother crying over the casket mm, at the funeral. Come on. They don't show those images in the videos. They don't show the collateral damage that you shoot somebody and you kill somebody. It's, it's, he's probably the best, I hate to say it, but he's probably the best one off because we don't know where he's going, but we know his mother's going to be crying. We know you're going to the, to the box. We know you kill somebody's brother, you kill somebody's nephew. So the collateral damage that you affect when you go out and commit these crimes, we don't, you know, the, these artists who I feel are, are in an influential place to, 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 to raise our children need to be doing more because kids look up to these guys. I'm here to share with you my story with the criminal justice system. I encountered the criminal justice system back when I was 17 years old. This was in 2007. I was arrested for possession of a criminal weapon. Um, then I was sent to Rikers, and at Rikers, I was at Rikers for about six months um, awaiting bail or sentencing. And throughout my time in Rikers, I encountered several different crazy situations. Um, but then soon, um, once six months came, my judge offered me a plea deal, which basically was to start to do six months at a at an alternative to incarceration program. Um, he offered me youthful offender adjudication and also five years probation. Um, once he gave me the opportunity to leave Rikers and start this alternative to incarceration program, I thought like I'm perfect. Like the, things can't get any better, you know. Um, you know, my experience at Rikers was, was crazy. I was in fights. After like my first two weeks in intakes, I was fighting literally for about the whole f first month, um, literally almost every day. So getting this opportunity to get my freedom back and just going to a, a turn into a incarceration program, I figured everything is great. Like I don't have any more problems. But little did I know that my problems were literally just starting. Um, soon after I was released and I was at the supervision of 
um, cases, I applied for um, I applied for Century 21 um, retail store. Um, I got the job. And as soon as I got the job, I was I was excited, like, oh, yes, I could continue going forward with my life. I had enrolled back into high school and I figured things are going great. But then two weeks after I was hired, I received a letter stating that um, I received a letter to my um, I received a letter um, to my apartment stating that, oh, my background check came back and that um, I, it showed like my criminal activities at the time. So I went to work the next day and they basically told me that I was terminated due to my criminal involvement. We are back. Does anyone want to share their thoughts on solitary confinement? I think one of the biggest challenges and issues we have at the Correctional Association with solitary confinement is often that if another human being did what prisons and jails are allowed to do, they would be arrested themselves. A lot of times our project director, Gabrielle Prisco, at the Correctional Association says, if a, ch if a parent put their child in a room for 23 hours in a day, only fed them once, didn't let them go out to play, that parent would likely be arrested. And if there were any children, other children in the home, no, those like, children would be taken away. Yeah, you had away. it right on that, because honestly, I just feel it's completely inhumane mm -hmm. um, in regards to not in, not just for you, but in just anybody. You shouldn't, anyone shouldn't be put in a box, in like a cell for 23 hours. You know, um, that, that makes anyone go, in, go insane. Like it messes with your your mental capabilities and what your, your thought process is like. So um, it's inhumane. It shouldn't even be done to, done to animals. So why are we doing it to our brothers and sisters? And then we expect them to forget about that. Yes. So yeah. when they come out, we expect them to be able to function properly and mm -hmm. still listen and obey orders and just be a functioning human being, not keeping in mind that that has affected them, that has impacted them. Yes. So much is about forgetting that they're a person and that they're a human being and that they're a brother, a cousin, a friend. So that is the biggest challenge I have with that whole setup of solitary confinement. These I, are people. Yeah. I, I once read um, personally in, uh, in a letter that someone was incarcerated to just hear straight from like their letter they wrote it while they were there. Um, he said, I've been in here for a few months. I haven't seen the daylight. Um, it's, it's hell in here. And honestly, like for my opinion, um, Like you're human. <laughs> I'm sorry. Just I had to really like, like um, no one wants to be in a like in a cell, um, four walls, and you literally make yourself go crazy. And to just even like hear about it, like when you come out of jail. And then what got me is the part where he said, "I don't. No one remembers me. No one. Mm -hmm. No one knows I'm here. No one comes to check up on me. No mm -hmm. one gives me a call. No one gives me a letter. I am literally no one in the world." when everyone is someone in the world, you know? No one, like your mom, your brother, your sister, you would never want to think that someone forgot your sister because that they're part of the family. No one, everyone knows their mom, but if they were in the system, oh, I don't know who she is, or I don't even know if she's alive because I can't even talk to her. And guess what, I'm human and I'm family, everyone's family, even as a community, we're family. And to just feel like, wow, I'm literally no one in the world, I'm forgotten and I'm in a box. Now, that is something serious and that is not something to be played with because we're human, we have emotions. So I think I stand strongly against that. I'm an emotional person. And guess what? I'm proud about my emotions and it's sad that someone feels like they, they have they're nothing. Because you know what? Everyone is something. Everyone is someone. So I went to youth represent and let them know my um, employment issue and they represented me on the, on the matter. They sent several letters on my behalf. Um, but then it came down to the fact that I, my, at the time, my conviction, I had a pled to felony. So I basically lied on my application by saying that I didn't, I wasn't convicted, even though it was a pled to conviction. So um, I wasn't well informed at the time. So you represent informed me of exactly what was on my record and how to discuss it. So after that, I'm thinking, like, okay, things are better. Like, and then I started doing an internship at the cases program. So I didn't even care about the 
Century 21 job. I'm like, hey, I'm doing this internship with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission and things are going much better. Um, but then the worst was to happen. I received a letter from public housing. Um, basically, well, my parents received a letter from public housing, basically giving my parents two options, which was one, to kick me out, um, to kick me out the apartment forever, which is basically called a permanent exclusion, or two, to fight the matter in housing court and face the chance of everyone in my family being evicted. At this point, that was really once I felt like the world was just on my shoulders. Um, I still remember this day like it was yesterday. Um, my parents, and my mom and my dad are from Guatemala descent. So me and one of my brothers, my brother, brother, ones who vividly just said, I remember vividly him saying, oh, tenemos que votar a Charles, porque todos nosotros no podemos estar en calle, porque una cosa que Charles de hizo. And I didn't say anything, but my parents was looking at me like, we're gonna try to fight it. Even though we're there, like, there's really no way. I really had no idea what we were gonna do. And they were like, we're gonna try to fight it. So then I went to my cases program, to my cases counselor at the cases program, and let them know about the situation. Once again, they referred me to Youth Represent, and I told Youth Represent, I explained them the situation, and then Laurie, um, the executive director of Youth Represent, was like, I need to meet with you and your family immediately. So at this point, I'm here like, Okay, um, we, set, we set up the appointment, and that meeting that I had with Youth Represent was a meeting that I will keep with me forever. Um, so basically it was me, my mom, and my, me, my mom, and my dad, um, and Laurie, the executive director of Youth Represent, and she was explaining to us all, like, the, all the options that we had and what we could do in regards to like, this permanent exclusion proceeding. And throughout that whole time, my dad was just there, like he was very serious. And then I, all of a sudden I saw him tearing, like it was like waterfalls just coming from his eyes. And I remember this because my dad was a seven year um, army veteran in Guatemala. And I've never saw him cry before that. Um, he was always like this tough going guy. Um, and to see him completely broken down, um, hearing the options and then only word he got out his mouth was, we're gonna fight it, we're gonna fight it. There's a great article called Million Dollar Blocks. And in the Million Dollar Blocks article, it explains that there's five to six neighborhoods in New York City that make up most of New York State's prison population, so over 70%. Those communities are your South Jamaica, Queens, your South Bronx, your Harlem's, your East New York's, your Brownsville's, your Bedford-Stuyvesant. These are the communities that have the highest concentrations of youth and adults who are being incarcerated. So most of the youth are coming from those neighborhoods. And also a lot of the youth have been system involved prior to coming into the adult criminal justice system. So they may have been in the youth justice system, they may have been in foster care or one of the other systems and they ultimately end up finding themselves in the criminal justice system. So you have youth who are coming from particular communities and you also have youth who are marginalized in a variety of different ways. Those are usually the youth you see who are the 16 and 17 year olds who are coming in contact with the adult system. Raise the Age New York is a campaign that supports raising the age of criminal responsibility for children in New York to improve outcomes for both children and public safety. For more information on Raise the Age New York, visit their Facebook page or follow them on Twitter. Okay, um, let's discuss the issue of prison industrial complex and the prison the school, the school pipeline. Can someone define two, these two issues? I think for us, the the issue that's the heaviest is the school-to-prison pipeline. And the school-to-prison pipeline is this concept that young people are continuing to be funneled into the system th from school. When we have schools nowadays, when we have more uh, school safety officers than we have guidance counselors or social yeah. workers, then we wonder why young people are having in-school arrests, summonses, suspensions. That's what we call the school-to-prison pipeline. Back in the day, there was a time where a young person could, you know, get into an altercation with the, another student. They could have a peer mediation session, or they could go to the principal and it's dissolved, resolved. Excuse me. Now, school safety office, officers are so present that they come into the situation and the situation can be escalated and a young person leaves school without their book bag and handcuffs. 
So this is where we're at, and that's what we call the school to prison pipeline. Young people constantly being funneled into the system from our schools, from, from our school system. I would like to add on that because what I think was also is really horrible about this like school um, prison pipeline is that it's not happening everywhere. It's happening in our urban mm -hmm. communities where our brothers and sisters are at. Um, it's not happening like upstate New York where it's a predominantly, like, predominantly white neighborhood. No, those schools, it's like in our schools now, um, let's say they have, like the kid, let's say is just talking too much and it's actually being like going at it with like the, like the teacher. In our situation now in like our schools, the teacher will call like school safety, school safety will get involved and depending on how that encounter goes, that young individual could end up being arrested by like the school safety who are like, uh, or who are also agents of like the police department. Mm -hmm. So they'll go through like the system while right now someone in like a different, like a private school, in a private high school, they have the same encounter with the, with the teacher. Oh, they started like for some reason like an argument, the teacher wants the young individual to get out they would call a school aide, someone in the school, to take the to take the um, student out and talk about the situation. Mm -hmm. That young individual wouldn't be going through the system, like someone in our ur urban neighborhoods, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and I think that's one of the things that's really bad, and it just shows that it's like their attack, like this prisoner school pipeline is it's real, and it's like they're attacking our youth um, mm -hmm. directly. For a youth to go into prison. Mm -hmm. It will cost around twenty-seven thousand dollars per year, mm -hmm. uh, coming from taxpayer. Mm -hmm. yeah. And for young adults, from probably sixteen and up, um, could, will cost around forty thousand dollars per year. Which surprises me most is that twenty-three thousand dollars. No, yeah, twenty-three thousand dollars cost for a community college and $40,000 cost for a private college. Mm -hmm. So it's really sad that we're not really using, we're not using that money to educate our youth, to educate those students, to give them a second chance and help them mm -hmm. go into college, not just put, put in that way and mm -hmm. literally waste all this money nice. where they're not receiving any type of help. Mm -hmm. So. Does. College versus prison, mm -hmm. prison's more, college is less. Mm -hmm. It's about investment. Mm -hmm. You put your money in what you believe in. Mm -hmm. If they believe that our young people are going to continue to go into the system, that's where they're going to put their money at. If they believe that we could work together and have more young people go to college and other educational programs, that's where the money would be. And there's a lot of people, other organizing groups, doing a lot of work around the school to prison pipeline and also doing work to sort of reinvest in our communities because that's really yeah. what we need more yeah. community centers more programs like safe passages at the correctional association just as a, a plethora of examples we can give in terms of alternatives where the money doesn't have to go to prisons mm -hmm. however when you talk about investment that's where they believe our young people are going to go so therefore that's where the money's going which is really unfortunately yeah. they have that type of mentality. Yeah, the money did go. But there's the we're not defeated. There's a lot that we can do yeah. with the little pennies yeah. that we get also. So that's for sure. <laughs> Any thoughts? Um no. Tanisha hit it right on the dot. I can't put it any, <laughs> I can't put it any clearer than that, honestly. It's like it's really more of like where we're gonna invest this our future and like is it are we gonna put our youth are we gonna see our youth in prisons or are we gonna see our youth mm -hmm. in school succeeding in life, you know? Um and as of now, we'll see which way it's going, but we're doing everything we can to change that. What type of programs are there for you to re rehabilitate their life after prison? I think there's so many programs uh, citywide to support young people who are re-entering the community. Could there be more support in those areas? Of course, but we have, I would encourage people to call 311 or do some research on the web to really find, because it's really a case-by-case -case situation. Mm -hmm. They have programs that are just for young men who are coming home. They have programs for uh, young people who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or queer, um, LGBTQ. They have educational programs. They have trading programs. There should be more programs. It's really funding on that end can be scarce at times, but there are programs available um, to support young people with re-entering the community. Yeah, I would say it definitely takes a part of 
um, a person trying to find out, trying to get their resources. So I would say definitely start online. Go find exactly um, community programs. There's community programs out there that would intake just about um, anyone who they who fits their criteria of their program. And there's tons of different programs out there someone could get engaged with. And then also there's legal services you could put, um, that help um, individuals coming home that's coming from like the criminal justice system to help them get over those criminal barriers, which is something that we do at Youth Represent. But there's also different programs that do that um, from like either individuals that unfortunately probably went through like the, I would say probably um, has been like human trafficked or stuff like that. There's like regardless of what I do, of how much I'm accomplishing, I will always have to address my criminal past. Um, and it's something that I've noticed that it's something that, even though I went through it, there's millions of other people going through the same situations, which is why I continue working um, within like the law field and why I want to become a lawyer now, um, just due to the fact that there's other young people going through the situation and there is help and there is a way to get through it. So thank you everyone for giving me the chance to explain my story and thank you for listening. Hi, my name is Stephanie and I will be reciting Sticks and Stones. Can't see the hate with my eyes, but I can feel it in my heart. Not an ounce of care attached. They're better off breaking bones. With sticks and stones, sticks and stones. Instead, why can't we build our young people with sticks and stones? As a community, hand me some of your African roots, your Latin spice, your Brazilian tongue and Asian mindset. People of color building together to make life greater with sticks and stones, with sticks and stones. Don't force us behind four walls made of bricks and metal. We're clearly stick and stone proof. We gathered all those stones you threw at us and took those sticks to build an empire. Made the foundation love mixed with integrity, overcoming our war that we're fighting with sticks and stones. They say that it takes a village to raise a child hand in hand as, as they, they say that it takes a village to raise a child, hand in hand, as one. We must influence our young people to have a brighter future. With sticks and stones, we'll have a throne. Is it okay?